Hello. And welcome to the second training session for QuickFile. My name is Amy and I will be conducting this webinar today for the first hour. And for the last half hour, my associate Brett will be conducting it. I would like to point your attention over to the right for the control panel of the GoToWebinar. There is a place there that is marked questions. Please feel free to open that up and Brett is monitoring it currently. And he, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask him and he will get your answers right back over to you. Okay. All right, today we're going to be covering a lot of information in a relatively short time span. Today is going to last roughly about an hour and a half, and we're going to be going totally over the client store. Okay? So let's go ahead and just dive in. As you see, we're on the first main screen here of QuickFile. We're going to go ahead and open up the client store. Here when we first come into the client store, you'll notice at the top of the screen we have some buttons that run across the top. Most of these buttons are what we call shortcut buttons. Um, these are things that you can do right from the screen without having to go further into the client's record. Some of these buttons are popular and they will be repeated on other screens that you will be seeing, but of course we will only go over them one time. Underneath here are the square more colorful buttons, and you can tell by the first button over here to the left that it's slightly depressed, so you know what we're on is called the search screen. So right here, this screen here is called the search screen. These colorful, colorful buttons belong to each client. So you notice over here to the right, we have the client and the client's name. So whatever client I have highlighted, their name will appear over here on the upper right. And each client has their own button here. So if I was to click on images, these are still, you see, Ben Tester's images. If I click on forms, these are Ben Tester's forms. Okay? Every client has their own area. There is no mixing up of client's information. Okay? Underneath here, we have client status. As you see, it defaults to active clients because that's generally what most people want to see when they first come in here. But you can look at just inactives or just prospects, which I have none of, or you can look at all your clients together if you would like. And you notice down here on the right, it says record one displaying one through 12 of 18 clients matching my search criteria. So that means in total in this database, which is pretty small, I have 18 clients. I switch it back to inactive clients here, and it shows you I only have three inactive clients. Okay, so it tells you how many clients you have in each section or all together. Underneath here, we have search type. It always does default to insured. That is the most popular. Okay, if I was going to do the search type insured, here we have type in insured name. And you'd go by the last name. And you don't have to put in the full last name. Let's say I'm looking for uh, the last name that starts with SM like Smith. So I can type in SM, click my search button here, and here's anybody with the last name starting with SM. Okay? Now let's say I did that and I did my work here with Amy Smith and now I want to see all my clients back again. I simply to the right of the search click on the Browse button. It will bring back all my clients again listed in alphabetical order, all my active clients because that is what I am marked on. Now we do have numerous other ways to search. We click the drop down here by search type and you see all these different ways to search by. The information had to have been entered on a client in order to you know, actually search by this. Do you see we can search by social security number, source, like source. We showed you yesterday how to enter source. And let's say I want to do source of um, walk-in. Click on search. These are all my clients that their source has been marked as walk-in. Okay. So there's lots of different ways you could do by insurance company. Okay. You can add email address, city, uh, first name, the spouse's first or last name. Okay. As long as the information is there, you can search by it. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to insured here. All right, underneath here, you see we do have a preview of all of our clients with their name, phone number, street address, client number, if you happen to have that. Now, this client column here that says C, if you hover your mouse over it, a tooltip will open up that tells you that C indicates commercial client. So that's what this stands for. I can simply click here as well, and it opens up this box that tells me C equals commercial client. So I can know right from the screen that Sally here and uh, Test quote and Sam's trucking, they're all commercial clients and the other ones are personal. Now underneath here, for whatever client I have highlighted, I have a preview of whatever policies this client has. Let's choose, there we go. Let's choose something in my head. There we go. Uh, and it tells you policies for John Q. Public. And here's all the policies for John with bits of information like effective date, coverage, and so forth. Now over here on the far right, it lists a premium, but the column before that says STAT. That stands for status. And as you see, a tooltip opened up when my mouse hovered over it and tells you what each one of these letters stands for. I can also click here and it will tell me what each letter stands for. So P is pending, C is canceled, and A is active, and e is, or X is expired. So I know right from here 
that um, John Q. Public here has got three active policies with me, one that's pending and two expired ones. All right, so that's what we get when we're basically just looking here at the uh, search screen. Now, when you come in here, the first thing you're always going to do is find your client. Search and find your client and make sure they're the one that is highlighted. Because if I click any of these buttons up here at the top, whether it be a shortcut button or one of these, these square buttons, it's going to pertain to the client that I have highlighted, the client I have listed here over to the upper right and whoever is highlighted. So first thing, always find your client. Now we're going to head to the very top of the screen. We're going to go through these buttons at the top. First button, of course, we have a help button, which we have a quick help screen. On your computer keyboard, you have what are called function keys, the F1 through F12, and they can be used to shortcuts. And this tells you which F keys, which function keys can be used from the different areas of our program. Like we're on the search screen, and from here I can perform these three different functions, like F4, view last 10 clients. So let's see that. I'm going to click on F4, and it'll give me the list of the last 10 clients that I have worked with. Okay. I don't have a full list of 10 clients here because I just opened up my database recently and I haven't went into 10 clients. Okay. But of course, throughout the course of the day, I will manage to get past 10 clients. Um, and it will only list all my last 10, and then I could simply double click on them and it would take me to that client. Also underneath help, we have view manual. This opens up a PDF version of our manual which you can print out or save to your computer if you wish, or you can always just open and view it from here. You do have to have Adobe Ac Acrobat Reader to read this. Um, it's a wonderful manual. Okay, besides these training webinars and you know we have uh, training videos online, this manual is a wonderful thing. It's current, up to date, very user friendly. Takes you through, you know, beginning and end of the program, the same stuff that we're doing here in the webinar, telling you how and explaining how to do things and what things mean in the program. Really good thing if you need to use it. What's new? Every time you do an update to the program, as currently you see we're working up here, it tells me on 3.7K. So when I update, updated 3.7K, that update was done for a reason. Maybe something needed to be fixed in the program. Maybe we added in a new feature, something like that. So from here, if you're wondering what was in that update, I can click on what's new. And this area will appear and it will show me what was new, okay, and what was fixed, and I can print this out if I'd like. Okay? And also under what's fixed, you'll find things like when we update a cord forms and things like that. Also underneath help, we have make a suggestion. This one is very important, um, especially for our new clients. You're going to be able to, you, we have a form online for our users group, and you can sign up for our users group, and you'll be able to log into our form and make suggestions on the program. We do look at every single suggestion. We have a person here that is their, one of their responsibilities is make sure that he goes through all of these suggestions. Sometimes he even contacts you if he feels the need to to have the suggestion explained further. Um, this can be from anything from uh, something bad, maybe there's something in the program you don't like or you feel it should be doing something that's not, or good. Maybe you just want to you know, say, hey, I like, I like this part of the program. Okay? Or you just want to have a, add a suggestion that you, there's a feature you'd like to see the program doing it's not doing currently. Please feel free to enter those suggestions. Next we have main menu, which of course takes you out to the main menu. Now, print. Okay, I have John Q. Public highlighted, so for him right now, under print, I can choose to print a letter or print a label. So let's take a look. I'm going to choose print a letter. Up opens up my box of my list of available letter templates. Okay, tomorrow we'll be showing you how to create your own letter templates and save them. And once you do, yours will be listed in here as well. But when you're a new customer, you're only going to see the ones that we currently provide you. Okay? So let's look at the birthday letter. I'm going to hit OK. Now you have to choose the policy that the letter you're printing pertains to. Now a birthday letter, not really overly important you choose the correct policy because it's for their birthday. But if I was doing maybe a pending cancellation notice or something like that for one of these policies, absolutely necessary to make sure you put in the correct one. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And now when this first opens up for this letter, the birthday letter, first thing I'd like to point out is at the top, we had showed you yesterday how in the utilities that you could have it defaulted so that QuickFile automatically puts your agency's information at the top middle of the letter when it's generated, which it did for me. This is the agency I'm registered as, as well as today's date and the client's uh, name and address, and there it is. So this was automatically generated right when, or automatically put on the letter right when I generated it. So tomorrow when we show you how to create letter templates, you don't even have to worry about this. QuickFile will do it for you. Now if you open up a letter and it looks a little squished like mine does right now, Simply click on it, it will magnify it, and you can read it more clearly. Now you do have the ability to print multiple page letters in here. So on the lower left, we have these little arrow keys, the little page keys. Uh, mine are grayed out currently because my letter is only one page, 
but if it was, say, two or three pages, I'd be able to look through each page and review it before I decide to print the letter out. Up at the top left, we can click on Print This Page, which of course will print only the one page displayed on the screen. Or if it's a multiple page letter, you can do print all pages. You also have the ability to, maybe you don't want to print this letter out right now. Maybe you like to uh, sit down and print all your letters out at the end of the day or maybe at the end of the day or something like that. Or you just don't have time right now, but you need the letter. Well, we give you the ability to save it for later. We're going to click on this Close button. And right here in the middle, this pops up, Letter Not Printed, Print Later. Like to know will delete the letter. So it tells me if I hit no, the letter is deleted, it's gone. But if I hit yes, it's going to save this letter into another part of our program called the mailroom into a queue where you can print it out at your own convenience. And we will be showing the mailroom tomorrow in the third training session. I'm going to go ahead and hit no though because I really don't need this letter. Also underneath the print button, we have print a label. Okay, let's look at that. Choose your policy, hit OK, and this opens up for printing a label. All right. First up, we have that you can choose to put the label in queue for later, which is what I just explained about the letters for printing later. You can do that with labels as well. You can save those up and print them out at the end of the day or whatever you prefer to do all at one time instead of printing the labels out individually. So I'm going to leave it right next to that. To the right, we have the different ways you can have the name and address displayed on the label. Do last name first, first name last, or insured. And we show you an example here. So we're showing you what it's going to look like before you actually print out the label. So if I change this to say insured, you notice that John's name is now gone and you put in ABC Plumbing because that's the insured I have listed for him. Underneath here, you can also choose to have a date type printed on the label along with the, the example here, the name and address. Uh, you can choose no date or any one of these types of dates, intent to cancel, uh, effective, ex expiration dates. Okay. Maybe you want to label for something other than mailing. Maybe for some reason you'd like to create file folders. And you want to label with the client's name and this information on it. Okay? Maybe I want the insurance company, policy number. As you notice, my example is changing along with me. Phone number, file number. Or, yeah, I could have a, one of these, two of these, four of them. Now, you'll notice, we, notice my example. If I check mark policy description, it appears right here where the insurance company had been. On the label, there's not enough room to put you know, five pieces of information along with the client's name, so we have to give one little item up. So if we choose policy description, it will uncheck insurance company and replace it with the policy description, or vice versa. All right, and then if, I, if I'm done, I just go ahead and hit OK, and now it will save my, let, my label later to print it. OK, it will be saved in the mailroom, and I can print it out at my own convenience. Now what if I want to print the label right now for this individual? I want to get it on, on my envelope and get it out in the mail. I can choose Print Labels Now. How you choose your criteria is exactly the same as I just explained. But if you notice, we have something new here. We have this black grid with the one white box. This represents your sheet of mailing labels. Okay, your sheet of mailing labels. The mailing labels that QuickFile uses, okay, the mailing labels that QuickFile uses are Avery labels. These are standard mailing labels. They come in a box and sheets. You can get them at any office store. You might have them in your office already. Avery labels, and they are 5160s, 5160, or 8160s, 8160. So it's Avery 5160s or 8160s. Those two numbers, um, there's no difference in the style between those two different uh, numbers for the labels. The difference is the paper type. It has to do if you have an inkjet or a laser jet, and just ask the, at the, uh, the office store what the difference is pertaining to which uh, type of printer you have. So now, the reason this is like this with a grid with a white box is there's no more wasting sheets of labels. You don't need a full sheet to be able to print out just a couple of labels. Okay? You can have a half a sheet. What this does is it allows us to move where the labels should be printed on the sheet. So let's say I have a half a sheet of labels here, so I don't want to print it up here. I want to print it down here towards the bottom. So I can enter my row. Let's say I want it to appear in row 6. You notice my white box moves and I want it in the second column. So now if I print this label, this is where it would print at on the sheet. I could also do multiple labels for this one client if I'd like to. Pretty handy, pretty neat. So you don't have to waste any more sheets of labels. You could have one label on this sheet right, right here. You could print it there. All right, it's pretty handy. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and close out of that. Next up, we have Add Memo. Quick file for, uh, for you for a lot of things that you do in the program will automatically generate memos for you. Like when you add a policy, uh, email a letter, delete a policy, delete a billing entry, things like that. 
it will automatically put memos in for you to save you a lot of manual work. But you can go ahead and add in your own memos. Okay, so we click Add a Memo, and this box opens up. We can choose who's entering the memo, what policy the memo happens to pertain to. We can put a memo type. When you are adding it in yourself, we just default it to memo, but you can be specific. This can come in, you don't even have to use this, but it can come in handy for a shortened search for memos. You could search by this type if you'd like to. So maybe this memo that I'm entering deals with, um, say it deals with an email I sent. I'm going to choose that. Now I can also set up a reminder date. Maybe I need to set a reminder for this memo as well. We allow you to, and you'll see as the training keeps going on, we allow you to set up memo reminders in a lot of different areas. Okay, this is just one of them. So let's say I set this up and I need to set up a reminder. You can do it from this day or any day forward. I'm just going to leave it to today's date. And I'm going to put in, that's test memo, call uh, about email. Okay, and I, wanna, I need to remind myself that I want to call them about the email. So I put in my memo, set a reminder, and I hit OK. Now the memo itself is saved in the memo section on the client right here it is. It time, date, and stamped it. Okay. You cannot um, do past, you cannot put in dates, old dates in here. Or you, know, uh, you cannot uh, uh, put memos in here. The reminders can be set in advance, but the memo itself can't be. Okay. Um, and it will tell you that if you happen to do that. Because sometimes you know, everybody's human. Sometimes dates on computers get off. Um, so here's my actual memo. And it shows me I have a reminder set. Now, where's that reminder? All right. The reminder, if I click here on Main Menu, as you see, this wasn't here before. Now it is. It says Memos Today. Click here. Whenever I have a memo reminder set for whatever date it's set, when I open up QuickFile for the first time during the day, you will see this yellow box up here. So if you have any memo reminders due for that date or any old ones you never got rid of, you will see this. And everybody does see everybody else's memo reminders. So I can click here, and here's my memo reminder. Okay. Uh, the things we can do here is I could have a bunch here, and I could choose to view this as a report. Okay, then I can choose to open this up, or maybe I want a hard copy, and I can print it out if I'd like. I can snooze this. So I have it set for today. Maybe I want to. I can't deal with it today. Maybe I want to deal with it in a couple days. I can change the date. I can move the reminder up to say Friday, and I can snooze it. It will disappear out of here. It will not appear again until Friday the 14th if I choose that date. I can append a memo, which means I can add to this. You cannot delete a memo, and you cannot um, uh, edit the original text memo, but you can add to it. So I could add this. Go um, and test add. Hit OK, and look, now I added to the memo. Okay, and this will be recorded back in the memo section as well. Now when I am done with a memo reminder, to get rid of the reminder, I'm simply going to click the Dismiss button. It takes one second. Okay? The memo itself is permanent and will always stay on the client itself on its record under the memo section. When we hit Dismiss, all we're doing is dismissing the reminder. Okay? Um, please dismiss memos when you're, memo reminders when you're done with them. Otherwise, they'll get piled up in here. And you have to dismiss them one at a time. Okay? So better off just dismissing them when you're done with them. Also, you can choose to search by specific dates. Okay, maybe you want to look for memos in the future or something. You can do that if you'd like. You can also choose uh, the agency, and you can also sort by CSR and by type. This is that memo type I was talking about that could be like a shortcut. I can look for all memo types. Now, I had said mine had to do with email, and that's the only thing you see. It says type email. So if I could choose the one that does pertains to claims, I have no reminders because I have none that are type claims. But if I go back and choose email, it's going to appear. This would show all my reminders that pertain to the type email. Okay, so it can help you. It can be a nice little shortcut. All right, so let's say I did this reminder. I'm done with it. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss it. We do give you a little warning. Are you sure you want to dismiss this? Because the dismiss is permanent. You cannot just throw the reminder back in here. It's, it's, like I said, the memo is permanent, but it will be just, the reminder will be dismissed. and will not appear again. Answer yes. Now it's empty because I have no more. I click on Main Menu. You'll notice my little yellow box is gone because I have no more reminders. All right, we'll go back into Clients here. Next one we have is policy issued. This is a shortcut to have it get a policy issued right from the screen instead of going to actually policies. Click on policy issued, and I happen to have one pending here. Let's hit OK. That's pending. I'm going to go ahead and put in a policy number because now I have that. Now, here's where we put in the premium issued, and I'm put it in the same as the quoted. Premium quoted should have already been here. You should have entered that already when you wrote up the policy for the client. Issued is when the, the policy is actually you know, issued it and it's issued for you. Uh, is when you put in the issued and make the policy active. Um, but if quoted happens not to be here, please enter it. 
if for some reason you probably won't use this here at all, if for some reason you're also right at this point in time receiving money in as you're issuing this policy, we do allow you to choose a description what the money is for that you're taking in at this point. But generally you're just going to leave that as blank because their client's usually not going to be right there. If there happens to be an additional premium, you can set up a due date. Quick file will automatically put in a memo for you. You can add to it if you want. I can add stuff to this. You can set up a reminder date, choose the CSR. And if you happen to have your own policy issued letter, you can click the drop down and choose it and it will also appear so you can print that out. Then go ahead and hit OK. Now, you'll notice nothing happened. It's still pending. That's because the screen needs to be refreshed. Let's hit the policies. You'll notice it is now active. Here it is. A policy will not become active until an issued premium is entered. If I do not put any issued premium, the policy will always say pending. Okay, so now it's issued. Let's go back to the search screen. You notice now it's active because I, I had refreshed the screen. Next up we have payment slash bill. First up here we have create a finance schedule. Here's where you can create a finance schedule. When you're receiving in money or entering finance schedules or creating a bill, you choose your bill type. Is it client bill pertaining to client or is it company bill pertaining to the company? Okay. Generally, if you're creating your own bills, it's usually going to be the client. Okay. You can put your transaction date. Now we can put in our monthly amount. How many payments is it going to be? Let's say it's seven. And let's say it's due, first one is due on December 1st. We can enter who's doing this. Now this is what's important. Right here it says create financing schedule and billing screen. And it's check mark. Only people who do in-house financing would have this check marked. Okay? That way if you're doing in-house financing when they pay, they come to you to pay and it goes into your bank account. You would want a billing entry so you can reconcile that every month as they pay you. But if you're not financing and you're not the one that's taking the money in and it's going directly into your bank account, but you still would like to keep a record of what's going on with their financing, their payment schedule, I would make sure this is unchecked. Then I could hit OK. Now I put no billing entries in so it would not mess up any of my financial reports. Yet on the policy screen, I have a record of it right here. This is where the finance schedule would then appear. So I know they have seven payments starting in December of $30 each. So maybe for some reason if they walked in the office and had, they, instead of sending it to the insurance company, they're like, hey, can you send it for me? We don't know right off the bat that you need to collect $30 and then you can forward it off to the insurance company. Okay? So you can keep track of that if you do not do in-house financing if you would like to. Also under here we have forward monies. I don't think I have anything to forward. Um, Let's see here. Basically, what forward money is for is, let's say that that happened. Okay, a client walks in your door and hands you their monthly payment. And they happen to have the money at the time they're going to give you next month as well. And they're like, hey, can you send this off to the insurance company for me? Okay. You want to keep record of that you took the money in, of course, but it's not going in your bank account. Okay, and you're going to be needing to send it off to the insurance company. So what you do is you would go ahead and put that monthly payment in for next month. And of course, it would be at a credit on the company's account, on your client bill, and it would be a credit. So then next month when I actually paid the company, I would go ahead and choose that entry, which would appear here. I'd choose that entry, and I'd go ahead and forward the monies, and QuickFile would know that you now sent the money off to the insurance company, so it creates a corresponding debit. So then it, it's no longer just a credit, also the debit's there, so now it's paid off and it balances out to zero. This is used when there's an outstanding credit for the company, and now you've paid the company and you want to get the corresponding debit to get it balanced out and show that you, don't, you no longer owe the company that money. That is what forward money is for. Create a bill. All right. You are more than welcome to create a bill. Again, choose your billing type. If it's client bill or company bill, transaction date. We can put in the amount. What is it for? What am I billing for? Maybe it's for an additional premium. Do I want to put a due date on it? Okay. If I happen to have a bill receipt, I can choose to print this out at this time if I'd like. We would go ahead and put in a memo for you. You can set a reminder on who's doing it. And we can hit OK. And now I created a bill in my client billing because that's what I chose. So if I look at client billing, here it is. Today's date, here's my bill, no credit because they haven't paid me yet. I just created the bill. So now I have the bill. You are more than welcome to create bills in this program, but everybody please, if you create bills in the program, you got to remember when you receive the money for that outstanding bill and the client comes and pays you, you've got to come in quick file and reconcile that outstanding bill. Okay? If you don't, you're going to start running financial reports, have all this outstanding money all over the place, pulling your hair out, trying to figure out why you have this outstanding money when you're sure that they paid you. Okay? 
So if you create a bill, make sure that when they pay you, that you come in here and reconcile it. Okay? I'm going to show you how to go ahead and receive in payments right now. And you also don't have to have an outstanding bill, and I'll show you, I'm showing you that right now as well. Because we also have payment slash bill. Receive a payment. Now, what we're going to do is when we receive it in payment, this first screen that appears will only appear if you have an outstanding, uh, an outstanding bill. Okay? The reason that is for is that the money, as you see, here's the one I just created. If the money they're paying me right now pertains to any of these outstanding bills, so I can choose it and hit OK, and it knows to apply the money to that outstanding bill. So if quick file does not create a new billing line, it will go ahead and apply it to that current outstanding bill. I'm going to go ahead and just go back in here. And if it doesn't apply to any of these outstanding bills, I would just go ahead and hit this button here. It says payment doesn't apply to above billing entries, create new billing line. And it gives me a blank one. Now I can also go ahead here and let's say it's for $100. We have a place for agency fees, for description, what's the money for. Let's say it's a monthly payment. If you need a forward date, you can do that. <coughs> excuse me, here's your payment type. Is it cash? Check to agency, check to company. Now, don't get these too confused, by the way. They're exactly what they mean, check to company or check to agency. Check to agency is when a check is written out and it's going into your bank account. Check to company could be that person walking in the door and handing you a check and uh, made out to the insurance company and you're just being nice and sending it off to them as a courtesy. Well, you've got to record that you took that money in, but of course it's going to the company so you mark it as check to company so you know it didn't go into your bank account. Uh, here also is where we have like ETF to agency. Okay? Over here we have a place to put in a check number. We also over have to the right where you can mark that as ETF to company, the electronics funds transfer, so that you can keep track of that's what happened with this. Now, if they happen to be paying you in two different uh, payment sources, uh, you can do that. Let's say they give me 100, the bill is $120, they give me $100 in cash, and now they're going to give me the $20, and they're going to give me a check for that. I can do that. So now at the end of the day, when I run my daily closeout reports, I know for sure the amount of cash and checks and credit cards and money orders I took in. Now here where it says create a debit and credit for the above billing amount, when you first come in here, it's always defaulted to unchecked, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. To the right we have where it says receipt, and it has my default from the utilities that I set up yesterday, a payment.rtf. Of course, you're not locked into it. You can click the drop down, choose something else, or none. We will put in a memo for you. You can add to it. You can set a reminder and choose who's doing this. So now, if I go ahead and hit OK right now, Without checking create a debit and credit, if this client's balance is zero, it's going to create a credit on their account of $120. Well, oh, you know what? I don't want that. Okay. So what you would want to do is when you want to come in here, you want to make sure you check mark create a debit and credit for the above billing amount. Okay? And this is why you also don't have to have outstanding bills. You can take this all in at once without an outstanding bill. Because what happens now with this check mark is I'm telling QuickFile is that the client originally owed me the $120, which is a debit, and they paid me the $120, which is a credit. And then hence that one billing entry balances out to zero. No outstanding money. Okay? When this is unchecked marked, it would create a credit. With this check mark, it would create the debit of they, I, they owed me and the credit of they paid me. That is basically generally what you're going to want unless you are purposely doing a credit. You're always going to want your billing entries to balance out. Once you checkmark this, this will remain checkmarked by default unless somebody comes in here and actually uncheckmarks it on purpose. And then it would remain uncheckmarked until checked again. So you can come in here and receive in payments and reconcile outstanding bills. Okay, it's pretty simple. You just follow it along. Make sure this is checkmarked. All right, that's it for here. Next up, we have an attend to cancel button. This is pretty handy, especially for those agencies who like to run reports on like pending cancellations or uh, print out mail, you know, print out letters or do emails to clients informing them that you know the policy plans and canceling. Maybe the insurance company said, "Oh, nope, we're going to cancel them," or maybe you did your, your renewal letters and client said, "Nope, I'm not renewing." So you want to set up an intent to cancel date. As I said, you can run reports and also do mass mailings based on this information. Let's say they plan. Maybe the insurance company plans on uh, canceling this. We can put in our intent to cancel date. We will put in a memo for you. I do highly recommend adding to this and setting a reminder like, um, uh, whoops, 
actually cancel because even though you have an intent to cancel date set up, once this date comes about, QuickFile will not automatically cancel the policy within QuickFile for you. Accident, lots of accidents happen that way. So you still have to go in and cancel the policy within QuickFile. Or maybe you want to uh, set a reminder to say, call and uh, double check. Maybe the client said they're not going to renew and you just want to give them another chance and call them up and say, are you sure you don't want to renew? And go ahead and you can set yourself up a reminder date. And to who did this, if you happen to have an intent to cancel letter, you can choose to print that out at this time as well. If for any reason you came in here by accident, you can back out of it by doing, I changed my mind. But I want to go ahead and set this. I hit OK. Now I have an intent to cancel date set up. Here it appears. Cancel on 11.30th. I know, right? Like, oh, no, I'm going to go ahead and renew with you. Well, now you don't want to intend to cancel because you wouldn't want that to appear on any reports or any letters. So we can make sure you choose the policy, choose intent to cancel. You see it's those that shows this one with this date. Click on I changed my mind. Clear the intent to cancel date. Yes, it's gone. No more intent to cancel. Next, we have cancel slash reinstate. This is a twofold button. If I click on this and choose a policy that is active, it will allow me to go ahead and cancel the policy. I can set up a cancellation date. Do I want to prorate it, short rate it, flat rate it? Most people do for, uh, prorate. I can put in a memo, reminder, CSR, do a cancellation letter. If I need the accord uh, cancellation request, I can check mark that and choose it to have up here. If I, I want to make a note that I'm auto forwarding the unearned commission by electronic funds transfer, I can check mark that as well. So I have a note of that. Careful of the two buttons at the bottom. The one that says cancel policy will cancel the policy within QuickFile. But if I come in here by accident, I don't want to cancel the policy. Maybe I'm on the wrong one. I can click on don't cancel policy to back out of here. So I can click on cancel policy. It went ahead and refreshed here. It's just John. You'll notice here's my cancel policy. Go here, and up here it shows me canceled, and it was today's date. So now this policy is canceled. As I said, this button up top is a twofold button, this cancel slash reinstate. So if I click on it and I choose a policy that is canceled, I can go ahead and choose it. Hit OK. It will ask me, are you sure you want to reinstate it? Yep. Then it tells you the policy has been reinstated with inside a quick file. And then it basically tells you just go ahead and verify your billing entries, make sure they're still accurate in case anything can change in the billing information from the cancellation to the reinstatement. Next up, we have a scan button. Okay. One thing, <coughs> excuse me, I want to point out from, from here, is you can scan directly from your scanner to this client, or we can do what is called batch scanning. And batch scanning is only available right here from this screen. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and open up batch scanning. Now, what this is for is you can scan, of course, directly into client. You'll be seeing that and scan it directly into their image section. But let's say you have a bunch of documents, like say 30 documents sitting on your desk, you've fallen a little behind, and they belong to 30 different clients. Well, this is kind of a time saver for something, that kind of a scenario, when you have multiple documents from multiple clients. Because we can come in here and just sit down and scan all those documents in, and then go down the line and attach them to each client. Okay. We're going to go ahead and take a look at that. And how I'm showing you to scan and the things that you're going to choose here will also apply when you're doing it individually. Do You see it's already defaulted to scan images. Over to the right here, we have Show Scanners User's Interface when scanning. We would like that check marked, when you're, especially when you're first starting out so that your scanner's interface comes up because you are used to it. Plus, you might have some things that, settings in there that, that might need to be changed. Okay? We also want force black and white checked here and also in your scanner's user's interface as well. We need black and white as well there. There's no sense in doing color, all right? unless you're doing like maybe a house or a car. Color just takes up a lot of room. Okay? You might as well do black and white. Isn't it? I mean, you don't need a, a document like I have here. You don't need this in color if there was blue on it. Black and white's perfectly fine. Plus, another reason to do black and white, if I am happen to be doing, whether it's here or uh, if I'm scanning directly into a client, if I happen to be doing one document that is multiple pages, I have to do it in black and white. If I select color, it will force it out into separate documents. If you are using an auto feeder, you can choose to check mark here, which is a sheet feeder. And then you can choose to have them scanned as individual pages if you'd like. If I uncheck mark this, it means I'm using a flatbed scanner, and I can choose how many pages per document I have here. And then it will go ahead and prompt me when I'm done scanning one sheet, it will prompt me to insert the next sheet. I'm going to go ahead and hit the scan button here. And I'll bring up my scanner's interface in just one second for you so you can see it.
Now here's my scanner's interface. Everybody's is different. Okay, I have an HP, but my, inter my interface is different from Brett's, my associate, who also has an HP, because I have a multiple function machine that does a bunch of things, and his, his does uh, copying and, and scanning, I think. Um, I can also fax from mine. So our interfaces are slightly different from each other. Now when I come into mine, mine scans whatever I have in there right off the bat. Okay, you see here, and of course, uh, good thing I'm in here. I, I have it cropping, and I shouldn't. I can't get a full document there. So it's a good thing I'm looking at my scanner's interface. Here now is where you want to make sure you check, make sure you're on black and white. Now, enterprise people. Okay, this is also, if I have standard desktop people on the line here, this is also a good rule of thumb for you. Okay, as I said about scanning in black and white, because you know, color pages just take up a lot of room. We do not limit the amount of images you can put on any one given client. You can put all the images you want on a client. There is, for enterprise people, a size restriction on the size of the image you can upload. Okay, we have to do that because otherwise we have people trying to upload 20 megabyte images. That's a picture of a driver's license, which is um, pretty unnecessary. Okay, um, so here are your size limits, and this is also a good rule of thumb for desktop because desktop your images are stored on your computers, and if they're unnecessarily large, they're just eating up memory on your computer for no reason. The size restrictions are if you are doing a PDF document, PDF it has to be six megabytes or under. Under is always better. Six megabytes or under. If it is a TIFF document, .tif document, it has to be two megabytes or under. TIFF document, two megabytes or under. If this is a JPEG document or anything else, maybe a GIF or a, a, a bitmap file, a, um, a Word document, it has to be one megabyte or under. So a, a JPEG, anything else like a GIF or um, a Word document, anything like that has to be one megabyte or under. One more time, PDFs have to be six megs or under. TIFFs are two megs or under. JPEGs and anything else are one meg or under. Also, beware of your digital cameras. Everybody uses those to take pictures these days. There are settings inside of there that you, you tell your camera what size you want your picture taken and save that onto it. You need to get in there and check those settings. Say my camera, which is a Kodak Easy, Easy Share, I can save, when I take a picture, I can choose to save it as a 4 by 6 up to 11 by 14. 11 by 14, when I save it, it means it's going to be saved at roughly 4 to 5 megabytes, eat up a lot of room on my little memory card, which I'm not going to be happy about. Okay? When I have it set like that, that means I'm going to take a picture that I fully expect to be able to take to a photo lab and print out a beautiful looking huge 11 by 14 for. Totally unnecessary in everyday life and in an insurance industry. You don't need that. So my digital camera for everyday life is set down to a 4 by 6. Okay, it takes a great picture. Um, I can get it on my computer, it doesn't take up a lot of room. And also I can still take that into a photo lab and print out a nice looking 8x10 if I need it. Uh, so get into your digital cameras, okay? Because if it is too large and you try to on your enterprise and you try to upload it, it's going to tell you file size too large. And then guess what? You're going to have to then get into your camera settings, reset it, and go out and retake that picture. Or you're going to have to purchase some, ty some type of software to be, able to be able to resize that image to get it smaller. Okay, and you're, gonna, that's, you're not going to want to have to sit there and have the headache of trying to figure out how to do that. All right, so get into your digital cameras, check your settings. Also, it could go by megabytes. So it's like one megabyte up to five. Set it down on one. You don't need huge pictures. All right, as you see here for mine, and also, if you happen to get the file sizes too large, besides for the size restrictions, check, make sure you're doing black and white. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, check your other settings in your scanner. Make sure none of them are set to custom. Some of them will become set to custom, already you know, set to custom, and you just don't realize it. So go ahead and check sure everything's nothing's on custom and everything's normal. So now if I want to actually scan this in for my scanner, I'm going to hit accept. It's going to go ahead and scan it in. It's going to take just a minute. And this is exactly how you'll be scanning, scanning and seeing when you scan directly into a client. I'm going to go ahead and bring back up my quick file. Hang on one second. As you see, now I have another document in here. These things will stay here. These are, these are still sitting on your actual computer until I actually attach them okay, and upload them. And of course, if you're desktop, they'll always be stored on your computer. So now from here, I can choose to maybe I need to combine images. Maybe there's two here that's actually supposed to be one document, and I want to combine it. So I can choose Combine Images, and I can drag and drop. I can combine this image with this image. It's called stacking. I can answer yes to stack. 
And now as you see, this is page one of two. I can also unstack. Maybe I did a mistake. Okay, so I can combine images right here. Now to attach them, I choose attach image. I'm ready to go ahead and attach to my clients. It tells you exactly what to do. This area appears. It says to attach. Double click on client while image name is highlighted. Okay, so I highlight my image. Go look for my client. Go ahead and hit search. I'll choose uh, Amy here. I just simply double click her name. Put in a description. I can choose who did it. Hit OK. Choose the policy <clears throat> that it goes with. That's important because you want to associate with the policy too. Because look at my person has multiple policies. I want to know that this goes with this one policy. And now it's been attached. Okay. And so I can just go down the line now and attach these all up. It's a bit of a time saver. And that's how you do how you scan basically. And that's how you're going to scan directly into client your file size limitations. And this was batch scanning. You can also delete an image from here right here, and it would delete it out. Go ahead and hit return, and I'll show you that the image was saved. Here's Amy. Go to the image section. This is their individual image section while all images that have been done are stored. And you see right here it is. Test Amy. Okay. All right. Uh, next up we have attach. If you have something already saved to your computer, or maybe you, you saved an email, if you're using Outlook, you saved an email to your computer, or an attachment, or you scanned something to your computer and you now like to get attached to your clients, you can do that. You can hit attach. Automatically de defaults to our image import folders. You see I have one thing here already, but I can browse my computer. <coughs> Excuse me. And I can go ahead then and find my whatever it is I want to attach. Put in a description. Choose who did it. Hit OK. Choose the policy. <coughs> Excuse me. Hit OK. And now it's been attached to client. How do I know? Let me show you. Here's images. There's Brett. Oh, that was the picture of my. He was really excited the other day. We ordered pizza. He was starving. As you can see, he was very excited when that pizza showed up. All right. So that you can attach. Again, here then we have the inquiry button. We do no training on this. We explained yesterday this belongs to the real time inquiry feature. Um, this allows you to, if you have downloads, you can sign up for this feature free of charge. Um, what this allows you to do, <coughs> excuse me, we're accredited right now with 30 to 40 companies that we can do this with through Ivan's. Um, what it does is, let's say I'm on a client and I'm on their traveler's policy, because I know traveler's participates. I could click on any of these things. I could click on, say, um, claims inquiry. What it's going to do is it's going to take me to traveler's website, log me into their website, and take me to that client's claims information for their claims. A lot easier than you know, opening up Internet Explorer, typing in the website, and you know, trying to go then log in and find the client. Okay, it's a quick link. Do no training on it. That is our search screen. Okay? The last button that we did not go through is Add New Client. So if you're going to add a new client, you click on Add New Client. And here's our blank Add New Client screen. When you add in a new client, they will automatically be made as an active client unless you want to choose to make them a prospect, which you can check mark here and choose to make them a prospect. Okay, and this is our client screen. You can add in the information. I'm going to go ahead back and actually just choose a client that's filled out already. Don't do Amy Smith. Let's go to clients. So here's the client screen filled out. So now I also have their policy information. I default in my utilities that this should default that it's always personal, but I can change it to commercial at this time. And when I just change commercial, this does change up a little bit. So I can put in the insured, the FEIN, business partner. Do we have name places for names, social security numbers, dates of birth? Salutations. This would be tied to when you create your own letter templates when we show you in, in the third training session. All these phone numbers you can put in, address, here's where it has miscellaneous. This is where you can mark the source okay, that you set in the utilities. Okay. This is where we mark our agent. And if we have our individual agent commission set up in utilities, this agent Chuck here will be tracked out as getting commission on all the policies here for Amy Smith. He's the agent of record and will get commission on all of her policies. Here's the sense date. This is you can put in when they became a client. Here's where you can put in their default language. Is it primary English, Spanish, or French? The reason this is important is that we allow you to uh, do letters in English and then recreate the letter in Spanish and have one, one letter with two different versions, one Spanish, one English. So let's say I wanted to do a birthday letter and I had this person marked as Spanish and I did it on this client. QuickFile would automatically know to bring up the birthday letter that's in Spanish instead of the English one. Also underneath here, we'll come back to email. Underneath here, we have the preview for the policies, all the policies they have. Down here, we have the company's uh, accounts receivable balance. Apparently, I owe the insurance company uh, almost $800. Over here is the client's AR balance. They owe me $70. Bucks. Now, the last thing here on this client screen, we are just here entering things, is email addresses. Okay, we showed you yesterday how to set up your email addresses, and you must be routing your email through Outlook or Outlook Express. 
Here is my email address, spelled a little different wrong, Healy, here at work. You can always feel free to shoot me an email. Yes, I want to change it. And here's my associate Brett's email address here at work. You have a quick question, email is the best way to get a hold of us because we do do this all day long. You can always call us, but you will get, you know, especially quick questions, email is the best way. So I have email one and two, and now I can email from here. It's going to open up my email box here, my print email fax. If the dot's already next to email because that's what I chose, but I could print if I wanted. Okay, it pulls the address over from the screen, but I can change it. I can also click this little button here, which is going to allow me to go ahead and um, it takes just a second to open up. It's going to allow me to pull an address out of my Rolodex, which we'll be showing you in the third training session. Or I can pull addresses from my Outlook. We cannot import or export with Outlook, but we can grab email addresses. Okay, place your subject. If you happen to have a cover letter, you can choose that. Include your email signature. I had set mine up in the utility, so here it is. Now on this client, you see we have letters, images, and forms. In order to email any of these things, they have to have already been done and saved on the client. So I have no letters, so I can't do letters. I do have some forms, so maybe I'm an email form, or I'm sorry, image, I'm an email image, and then here's my forms, I have no forms. I can select and attach multiple things to the email. And click on send, and email is in, and I'll be receiving it here in just a couple of minutes in my own email. So we can send emails from here, we can also send emails from our images and forms as well. Back at the top of the screen here, for this client, we can choose change status. This is where we can move this client around. They're active right now, I can choose to make them a prospect or inactive or vice versa. Okay. We can also delete client. Remember, delete is permanent. If I choose to delete client, we do give you a warning. But if I choose to delete them from here, it will delete the client along with every stitch of information that belongs to them. And it is permanent. Okay. So be careful. This warning comes up. Make sure it's what you want to do. We have the same payment slash bill button. I showed you that. We have the same print button, but we've added to it that you can print out an envelope address to the client. Or you can also do what's called print screen. That would print out a picture of the screen with any information that you can currently see on the screen because maybe you need to take the information uh, out in the field with you for some reason. You can set an important note. That's this yellow post-it looking note. If I want to put the date on it, I can put date. Um, I can uh, put an important note. Uh, out to town until, I don't know, 2010. I consider that pretty important whenever I'm dealing with this client to know that they're not even in town. Now I can close this and here's my important note. It's still here. And if I click on any of these boxes for this client, let's say I click on company billing, it still will appear on the upper right. Also, if I switch around clients here, all right, and let me go back to Amy Smith and I click on anything here, let's say I click on forms, my important note is the first thing that's going to pop up when I first go into my client. Okay, and then now to go about my work, I need to shut it. Now when a note is no longer important, I can simply click here or click set important note. I can clear it. Or I can manually do it if I'd like. Answer yes. Now it's empty. Shut it. Now it's gone. We only have a place for one important note. So if you have multiple important notes, you will have to enter them in the memo section. But always keep in mind our important note here can hold, uh, I think it's roughly like 225 or 250 characters. So it holds a lot of information. Again, we have the same inquiry button and then we have an add new client here as well. And that's our client screen. Next up, we're going to go to the policy screen. Here's where we're going to enter our policies. This is where a lot of our defaults come into play. We can click Add New Policy. And this is where my defaults come into play. I click the drop down. I can choose the line of business. I did my personal auto here, auto. Uh, what did I write? Uh, let's say I did PIP PD. What company? Um, oops. I set up a test one yesterday. Yeah, there we go, test insurance company. Financing, let's say it's direct bill, so I can put in a finance contract number. I can choose a payment type. How are they paying? Once I choose that payment type, this box opens up to, and it enables us to enter our down payment. So let's say they're giving me a $600 down payment. This debit date here will always be the effective date of the policy. Okay, so if you're ever coming in here and doing this, and it's a different date than the effective date, make sure you change this. Okay, so it's recorded properly. All right, you also have places for option coverage, uh, agency fee. Let's say we're doing a $10 agency fee and $3 MVR fee because I had to pay $3 for my agency when you know pass the cost off to them. I can also choose if I'm doing an optional coverage. So here it gives me my total amount down payment due. Um, and here's my down payment received. This should be the amount of money I receive. Uh, if there happens to be an IOU, maybe they're not giving me the full amount. Maybe they're not giving me $600. 
I've only, or they're only giving me thirteen dollars. They're IOUing me six hundred dollars. So it shows me I've only received six or thirteen dollars, and I owe you out six hundred dollars. I can set up a due date for that if I'd like. We also have a place that you can mark ETF to company if you'd like. I'm going to change this back just for simplicity. If they're doing a split payment, maybe part check, maybe part money order, you can record that as well. Then if I click on print, it's going to go ahead and bring up our default down payment receipt, which um, uh, you can always edit it. If you don't like our down payment receipt, we'll be showing you how tomorrow you can create your own or edit ours if you'd like. Answer no to that. And you also notice the information I entered here carried over to the right where it says agency fee, gave me the $10, and where it said NVR fee, I went ahead and gave me the $3. Or I'm sorry, where it said uh, yeah, agency fee on NVR3 gave me the $10 and the $3. Automatically put it there, as well as it automatically put in my premium down payment, which is $600. And my total down is my premium down plus the agency fee and NVR fee, because that's stuff that I personally am charging to my agency. I need to collect that up front along with my uh, down payment, because that can't be financed or anything like that. Moving back over to the left here. Here's where you can put in the policy number. It always automatically comes up pending until you actually put in a policy number. Okay. Binder number until you have it set to automatically do that, but I can wipe it out or change it if I need to. Binder date and effective date are always set for today's date. I can change it if I need to. Here's where I can choose what type of policy is it annual, semi-annual, so forth. Here's my, of course, my effective date. Expire date is calculated based on the policy period and the effective date. It cannot be changed. You cannot come in here and manually change the expired date. You have to change the effective date and the policy period to get that to change. So if you watch, you see it's on 11-12-09. I'm going to change from annual to monthly. You notice now it changed to 12-12-08. Okay, so it's automatically calculated for me. Here's where I can put a CSR of record. And if I have my individual commission set up in utilities, this CSR will be tracked out as getting a commission on this one policy for this client. This is where it's marked if it's new business renewal or rewrite. This is done automatically for you. You should not have to select this. Um, okay, and this is policy description. This is a free type. I can type in something I guess important to me pertaining to this to this policy. Okay, um, maybe I want to make sure that I know that this is a classic uh, car. I want to know that. Then from over here, we move over to the right. This is where we this our premium and commission. You notice here where it says premium and commission and grade. There's a little box. And mine has an N, and where it says commission is zero. So I know right from here that after I chose my, my line in insurance company, I know that I did not in my utility set up my default agency commission for this insurance company, for this line. For this line. Okay? So at this point, I might want to stop it and go do that. Okay? But if maybe I don't want to do that, and I, b I never write this company. I'm doing it maybe one time only. Or maybe there's something special about this policy, and the commission rate is going to change. I can change this stuff on the fly, and it will not affect my defaults. I can double click here on this box. I can put in a commission rate. Here it's this premium. I can also double click on it and change it from net to gross to monthly if I need to. All right, And this will affect only this one policy. This is where I'm going to go ahead and put in my quoted premium. Always put in quoted, please. It calculates my agency commission. <coughs> Excuse me. Once the policy has actually been issued and the company says it's issued, I can go ahead and put in my issued premium. You know, calculate my final agency commission. Now you see this place that says AP appeared, and that stands for additional premium. So once it's issued, maybe it wasn't what I actually wrote it for. Maybe there's a violation on the NVR, and they said, no, it's uh, $4,500. OK, and that this is asking me what my AP is for. I'm just going to cancel it. So it shows me I had a $500 AP, and it increased my agency's commission by $50. OK, I'll go ahead and put this back to zero, though, just for, or I'm sorry, to the 4000 just for everything to be nice and clean and simple. Here, of course, we can put in our optional coverage, additional coverage. If we have our default setup, we can choose what it actually is. Here's our a, uh, agency fee, MVR policy fee. This is where I had showed you before where you can put in your number of payments, monthly amount of first due for a finance schedule if you'd like to keep a record of it. All right, so that's this area right here. We're going to move underneath here over to the left. It says forms of this policy. And this is all for each individual policy. Okay. This client doesn't have any forms, but if she did, as I choose a policy, whatever policies are associated to this, uh, whatever forms are associated to this policy would appear here. The actual accord forms are actually stored in the form section, but as a shortcut, we list them here as well. And you could open up and already save one and print it, email it. You know, you could uh, finish it, change something if you needed to. We can also add a form from here. We should open up our list of um, available accord forms. You can see your state or all states if you'd like. You can go ahead and choose your accord form. 
anything in yellow in a chord form are places that can be edited or filled out. If you ever open up an accord form and don't fill anything out and hit return, it will not be saved. Okay, I have to fill something out. Let's put some stuff in here. Whoops. Oh, I changed policies, that's why. Sorry about that. Yes, yes, yes. Go back to my original policy. There we go. All right. So I click add a form. Now, as I said, you have to type something in somewhere. So let's go ahead and I'm just going to open up a, let's open up something a little, I'll do auto endorsement. So here you go. We do pull in my information, put it over on Geo Accords for you, like the name, here's policy number, uh, inception date, expiration date. It just depends on what the, the uh, line of business is and what the accord is as to what information we can pull over. So I can type something somewhere, fill it out, hit return, it is saved. Here it is, and it will be saved in my form section. Here's our producers button. This is the third way, or the only way maybe, you would like to be able to track out your commissions for your individual agent CSRs producers. Okay? You guys might, whoever's you know, listening, might be considered an agent CSR producer all the same person. Some states they don't. Okay? That's why we have to offer all of them as of right now. So we have producers here. The one neat thing about this producers button that is not available when you track via the agent from the client screen or the CSR from the policy screen as this is tied to re a certain report called producer's reconciliation that will allow you to manually reconcile your producer's commission as you pay them. That is the big difference between uh, entering your producer's agency SRs here versus those other two places. Okay? So we can go ahead and enter our producers here. Okay, and it pulls our default from the utilities and go ahead and calculates it for us. All right, to the right of that, we have endorsement history. This is where any endorsements you have for this po and whatever policy you're on will be listed, and we'll come back to that. One other thing I want to point out here on this screen is we do have a button called Policy Detail. This is a highly improved button. Uh, in the past, before 3.7, it only worked with auto and homeowners and really didn't do a lot of stored information. Now Policy Detail works with four lines of business. It works with auto, homeowners. We have also added general liability and commercial auto. So it works with commercial auto, general liability, auto, and homeowners. Any other line of business or any other wording, it will not open. Okay? So I have auto, so let's open this up. Now it says C's that I did in accord form. This is one of the new changes we did. Um, you're allowed to pull information from here onto an accord or vice versa. And it will see when you update that information and ask you if you'd like to update it. Like it sees it and asks me if I want to update it. I can answer yes. And it will update it, okay, from the information I had in the accord, which I didn't put much. And this would be just a kind of a, uh, a total of everything I put in here, kind of like a preview, a combo page, as it says. Here's where I can enter my drivers by simply clicking Add. And I can go ahead and put in more drivers. Okay, all this information, social security numbers, okay, occupation, dates of birth. You can put in sex, uh, you know, all this stuff, driver's license date, and the employer's name, all this. Hit OK to save it. We can also edit or delete. From here we can go to vehicles, where we can add a vehicle. Okay, lost payee. This is kind of neat. You can manually type one in, but if you have to have, happen to have your lost payees listed in your Rolodex, which we'll be showing you in the third training session, you can click this little button, this ampersand, and it will open up the Rolodex and allow you to pull information from your Rolodex over. Okay, so maybe uh, I actually want this as my lost payee. I can hit OK, and you'll notice now they're listed here. Okay, and we can go on to doing coverages. We choose our auto edit, and we can go ahead and put in choose a driver and. I mean, you get the idea here. You can add all this information. You have a place to put notes pertaining to this one policy. Okay. We also have a modification log. It's blank right now because I haven't added it or I haven't done anything. But if you put information in here and save it, and then somebody comes along and opens this up and changes it, there will be a log made on it. Okay. It will tell you what it originally said, what it was changed to, and who changed it. It will keep a log of any changes. We also have an archive. So this is a new business policy. Now let's say the renewal comes through. It will archive the, the original one here so you can still read it, but it will make the renewal as the current policy that you're working on. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go back to, say, combos. Um, and you see my information I've done is filling out here. Most every screen at the bottom has got this button that says Policy Summary. This is like a huge deck page. It's got all the information that I've entered here. Okay? Mine won't be too big because I haven't entered you know, a lot of information. But as you see, it gives me a lot of information. You know, all this information, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, so this tells you every every last bit of information you put in a policy detail button, it will appear here. Okay. Also, that the other improvement we've made here is when you do downloads, and you download, let's say, an auto or homeowners policy. See, the information will also be populated here in the policy detail button for you. We're going to head to the very top of the screen and go uh, through these buttons across the top. We have a cancel button that will cancel this policy with inside a quick file. Delete will, of course, delete this policy. We have the same print, intend to cancel. We have a renew button. So if I chose a policy, it's new business, and now I chose I need to renew it, ask if you're sure, yes. If you happen to have our Quick Quote program, our rating software, you can renew through Quick Quote. Otherwise, you won't see this. I'm going to answer no. Okay, it says it has been expired, and do I want to reset it? Yeah. So now it pulls over my information from my original, okay, and I can add to this however I need to. Okay, and you see it automatically marks it as renewal. Okay, so then there would be my renewal. And then once the original is expired, the original will show up as expired, and then this would be the renewal that's active. Always remember, a policy, even though it's been renewed, will not show as expired until it actually expires. Okay, because sometimes policies are renewed before the original, the new business, the original one expires. Okay, so remember that. I'm going to go ahead and delete this. I really don't want this renewal. Endorse. Okay, so let's say we had endorsement on this client. Endorse manually. Uh, this will appear if you're doing auto insurance automatically. If it's not auto, it'll ask you to to manually type it in. Uh, we're going to go ahead and here's an endorsement type. Let's say I added a car. You can choose any of these items. You can choose to have the accord form pop up, the generic uh, auto accord or the auto change form. Okay, I'm going to choose not to. I can hit on endorse. It pulls my information over, my policy number, what has changed. It has places for all the same stuff that our policy does. Okay. Here's where we can go ahead and let's say we added a vehicle and increased it by $100. Okay, because it populates my commission. Um, and let's say it was issued at $100. All right. Now, if they've actually paid me, because this will not appear in my billing section until they actually pay me. So if they paid me, I'm going to go here where it says down payment and say they actually paid me. Okay, and I can print out a receipt if I'd like. All right, we also have places for optional coverages, agency fees, your commission, uh, the, there's fees on commissions, all of that. I can hit OK. Now it's endorsed. Here is my endorsement, and it shows me what was done on what date, and here is the premium change of $100. You notice my original premium of $4,000 did not change, and it won't. We always show you the original premium, but I can look down here and see that it increased by $100. And of course, endorsements will show on reports. Now, let's say for some reason I needed to get rid of this endorsement. Maybe I was wrong or something. Did the delete endorsement, I can simply double click on it. Click on delete. It will warn me because it is permanent. I answer yes, it's gone. Back up at the top, we have the same policy issued button. We have a new button here, though. We have garage slash property address. Each policy for this client can have a separate address. Okay? Because on a client screen, of course, you want their mailing address. So that when you send letters, things like that, it's the correct address. But maybe this is I said classic car. Maybe it's garage in a different place in my mailing address. I could enter that here. Okay, and I can hit OK. Now you notice I'm going to change policies. If I click on this button, nothing. That's because I never entered one for this policy. But if I go back to my original one here, there's the one I just entered. So every every policy of this client can have a different address. And then at the top, we have the Inquiry button. And then if you want to add a new policy, we have the Add New Policy button. I have one last thing that I forgot to show you. I apologize about that. It is this calculator right here. We did show you it yesterday in the utilities. Um, and we explained to you, you only, this calculator is for those fees that those companies charge out, like tax rates, the hurricane, fund, uh, the hurricane catastrophe fund, all that. We showed you a place to set up in the utilities. And we told you in the utilities, when you set it up there, it has to, if you're setting it there, it means it applies across the board for the insurance company no matter what business you're writing. All right? But if it doesn't and you can set up the utilities and it applies only to certain policies or maybe you only do it every once in a while, we have the same calculator here where you can enter the fees here and then it would, end, it would apply only to the one policy you're working on. Okay? So this has been issued, so I want to make sure I'm doing it on premium issued. Here's my premium, which means my premium with any fees I'm going to enter in total is $4,000. Okay? So let's say uh, there was a tax rate. I'm just going to go over this briefly since we did it yesterday. Uh, let's say 5%. Okay, tells me my fees. Shows me down here my net premium is $3,810. And then here's my commission. And then here's my commission for the policy. Because filling this out means that 
my total premium with a three with a five percent commission rate is four thousand dollars, and I don't receive commission on this. So QuickFile now knows to pull four percent out of this four thousand or five percent out of this four thousand dollars, and then calculate your commission since you don't receive commission on this fee. You want to make sure your calc your commission is calculated properly. It would also do it vice versa. Let's say you do get a commission on this fee. I could check mark here. You notice it changed because I'm telling QuickFile. This is my total premium. Don't pull anything out of it. Leave it alone and give me the commission on the whole thing. All right. That was the last thing. Sorry, I forgot to show you about that. All right. That wraps it up for my end of it. Um, the reason my end of it took so long and we only went through three buttons is because there's a lot of stuff in those three buttons, a lot of information, a lot of functionality. But that's going to go ahead and take over. There really isn't much left to do, maybe 20, 25 minutes. These last buttons don't have near as much functionality to them. All right. Uh, Everybody, the question section is still open. I will be taking over to monitor it. So any questions, please feel free to ask them. And we're going to switch over to Brett. Thanks. OK. Um, Amy left off at our memo section. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and dig into the memo section. What you see here is you see the memo screen on your, on your quick file screen. So what we're looking at is we're looking at the results of all the memos that you've entered in on your client screen, your policy screen, your search screen. We're looking at everything. So what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing all of the um, I'm seeing all of the memos that I've done for this client. I'm seeing the date and the time that it was entered. I'm seeing the memo that was entered, the reminder that was set for it, if I dismiss the reminder, and who the CSR and the policy was that was attached to. All right. I also have the memo type. And in the memo type, what I'm looking at is what type of memo it actually was. So however we classified that memo is what we're going to be seeing displayed here. Now, if I want to, I can click on Show All Policies, okay, and I can see memos that only pertain to certain policies. So if I want to narrow down my search to a specific policy with a group of memos, I can do so. I select App, so then it's just this particular memo that is related to this particular policy. Okay. I also have the ability, if I bring back all of my memos, I also have the ability to click on my memo type filter and display only memos that pertain to this particular client, such as phone, memos, and emails. So that's all we're seeing right here. These 14 records are all that. Okay. If I select all of them and click OK, now you see that I actually have 177 memos uh, listed right here. So in those 177 memos, these are all the things that took place. And as you remember correctly, Amy um, showed that we were actually um, that we were actually doing memos uh, as we did perform certain functions. So for example, if I created a bill, it created a memo. If I uh, sent an email, it created a memo. If I deleted a letter, it created some type of memo. So there's all kinds of things that we're, all, that we're doing. Eventually, these are going to get really filled up. And you're going to want to look for a specific memo on a specific time and a specific date. Okay? Again, you can filter it down by policy. You can filter it down by the memo type. And maybe you don't want to see memos and phones listed here. Maybe you don't want all these types displayed. So if I deselect all of them, I would only get these. I can uncheck this one, and if I only want to see my memos, because I know that's what I classified it as, I can click OK, and then I would see my memos. Okay, so there's all my memos. You'll notice that some of these memos are highlighted. To highlight a memo, you simply click on Highlight Memo, and it'll turn it this bright yellow, as we see displayed here. If you want to unhighlight the memo, okay, then we can click on Unhighlight, and it'll unhighlight the memo. Right, or highlight it. You can void a memo. You cannot delete an actual memo. Memos are permanent in the, uh, in the memo screen. So uh, what's ending up happening is you cannot delete them. Once you, delete the, once you, uh, once you enter a memo in, it's, it's there forever. All right, but what you can do is if you incorrectly entered a memo or you want to uh, remove that memo for whatever reason, you can simply click on Void Memo up at the very top on the toolbar, and you can void that memo out. If you don't want to see any of your voided memos, you can check this box here that says Don't Show Voided Memos, and it hides the voided memo. It's still there, but it's just hidden. Okay. All right. 
And then we already talked about appending and adding information to a memo, snoozing the memo. Amy covered voiding a memo, or I just covered voiding a memo, and she covered all the rest of these. You can print out your memos, so if you want to print them, you can select print, okay? And this will print based on the list that I have selected. So if I just wanted to print out these memos, I could click OK and print out those memos. Okay? And then it would list it here in a preview, and I would be able to print that out and, and keep it. Okay? All right, moving on, client billing. In our client billing section, this is a result of all the entries that we've made in our policy screen, such as down payments, payments, um, anything like that. As you can see, I have a down payment listed here. All right, and that was automatically brought over when I purchased or when I uh, did my down payment receipt. If I added a monthly payment, that would be automatically listed here as well. Here's my debit and my credit for that. In my company billing screen, it doesn't change much except for right here. This little wording that says client billing, it would change to company billing. Okay. The only difference between the client billing and the company billing is the fact that we show that we have commission to do either commissions due on an endorsement or commissions due on a policy. Okay? So if we had commissions due on a policy, we would see that listed here. All right? Now, um, how do things get in here? Well, let's just kind of give you a quick example. You see we have this $200 down payment listed right here, and we also have the agency fee, the MVR fee, and the policy fee listed here. So. If I open up my down payment, and I click on, I'm not going to print out my receipt, but if I go into my client billing screen, my down payment right here is listed, my $225. Now, of that $225, we have some fees. So if I double click on the entry, I'm going to bring up the details of this bill. Okay, when I bring up the details of this bill, it'll tell me, this is the down payment, these are my fees, my agency fee, my MVR fee, these are fees that I charge that stay within the agency. If you're in the state of Florida, you know that we can't charge any fees uh, such as agency fees, but we can charge MVR fees uh, to recoup that cost uh, from our potential insured. But what we can't do is charge an agency fee. All right? So that being said, um, you probably wouldn't see this listed here. You would just collect the down payment and any uh, MVR fees that would be listed. Uh, let's go ahead and click OK. And also, payment slash bill, all the same functionality that Amy pointed out on the payment slash bill is listed right here. I can void a bill, but once I void the bill, I can't unvoid it. So you want to be really careful about that. Also, if you want to delete a record, like let's say somebody made a mistake and they want to come in here and delete it, if I try to delete this row, I'm going to get this message that says I can't delete a billing entry associated with a receipt. So if I've actually printed out that receipt, it's no longer able to be deleted. I could void it, but I can't delete it. Okay, So I can't get rid of those. Um, also, let's take, for example, that uh, in our quick file program that we want to go ahead and um, print an invoice for our client. Let's say that we want to print an invoice for this $125 that I've got outstanding right here that's due for me uh, by this client. If I go up here to the very top and I click on print and I select print invoice, you'll notice that all the items that I have are checked. In other words, these are all check marked and they would actually appear on the invoice if I selected print. Actually, the first eight rows would appear. What wouldn't appear um, would be items that are too big for the actual uh, invoice itself. So what I'm going to do is I really only want to bill for the 125 bucks, And I only want to bill for the date that I have listed, which is that 1029 date that we see in the background here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck all. I'm going to scroll down my list, and I'm going to find the 1029 entry, which is this entry right here. It's the very last one. I select that, and now it shows me that my balance due is $125. When I click on Print, here it is. And it pulls over the date, the policy number, the company, the coverage, the monthly pay, uh, the description of that, the debit, and any credit. So if I just have the debit in here, then it tells me my balance is 125 bucks. I can put a note in here okay, that says, 
please remit payment upon receipt. All right. That being said, I can put that there and I can print out my receipt. Now, once I print out the receipt or print out the invoice, I apologize. When I print out the invoice, the number of that invoice will be on your on on there. So you'll be able to see what the invoice number is. Let's say that this is a homeowner's policy, and you were actually billing for uh, billing the mortgage company for the actual homeowner's premium. That being said, if I click on this little ellipsis right here, I would bring up my Rolodex. Okay? When I bring up the Rolodex, it would allow me then to choose, say, a lien holder. When I click on OK, it changes the lien holder information and pl places it in here. It changes it sent to and places it here. If they were going to remit that to the insurance company directly, I could do the same thing here. I just click on the ellipsis box, and let's say I want them to remit it back to AIG. Okay. If I say OK, then it'll put that information in this screen. So now I could print the invoice out, mail it, send it off to my client or the mortgage company, and then they would turn around and remit it directly to the insurance company. All the information that the client needs or the mortgage company needs is listed right here. Policy number, company, coverage, description. Okay, And on top of that, if you want to say this uh, you know, is for client you know, so-and-so, then that's fine. Right? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and close that out. That's how to print a receipt or print an invoice. Now, a lot of times you may not want to actually print an invoice using any one of these numbers that are listed right here. So that's the case. Click on Print and select Print Invoice. When you select Print Invoice, you uncheck All and just simply click on Print. Now you can enter in all the information that you need right here. So if you want to enter in the date, the policy number, it will bring up a blank invoice. Fill in what you need or what is required. Print out the invoice. And once you print the invoice, it's automatically saved to your client. In company billing, you see that we have these commission due items. In tomorrow's training session, we're going to show you how to reconcile commissions. If you, it, we strongly suggest that you do not reconcile commissions from here. We have a much better way, much more efficient way to reconcile your commissions. So if you see a commission due, don't panic. It just means that that commission is due, and in tomorrow's training session, we'll show you where you can actually uh, reconcile those commissions and reconcile them correctly. Right? Um, again, a lot of the same functionality applies right here that it applied in the client billing screen, delete row, print, void item, payment slash bill, details, and inquiry. Right. Next we have our images. And once we're in our images section, you can see that all the images that you scanned either from the search screen or you came in here and directly scanned into Quick File are all listed right here. Any descriptions, policies that you attached it to, dates that you attached the, the uh, item, and then its actual file name are all listed right here. Okay. What you can do is you can still attach from here if you want to attach, or you want to add pages to a, a TIF document. As you see, I have a whole bunch of TIF documents here. So if I wanted to add, I could, okay. provided that that is another TIF document. I can detach an image. If I detach an image, let's say I want to detach this image. If I click on Detach Image, and I say Yes, What's going to happen is it's going to bring up this message. This message is really very important. Delete image. All right? It's asking you a question. Selecting no will move the image into the image import directory. That image import directory is located on your local drive in your QuickFL folder. Okay? If I select no, it will move it into that folder. Delete image. If I say yes, it will permanently delete the image, and I have no record of it, okay, unless it's stored somewhere else on my desktop. Okay? Because what QuickFile won't do is it, won't, it, it will leave the image. If you attach an image from your computer here, it will actually leave that image in its original directory. Okay? If you delete an image, it'll, it'll, that original image will still be listed in your computer in that original directory, but it will delete it from QuickFile. 
So it's just deleting it from the program. Okay. Um, so it's always important to have some type of backup, especially for you desktop people, of your images. All right. Just in case somebody actually accidentally comes in and gets rid of an image. You know, it's, it happens. We make mistakes. I mean, um, I've had. I've had clients that you know had deleted an image, and they go, "Oh my gosh, what do I do with it?" Well, if you've kept the original image on your computer, you'll still be able to restore it and attach it back to the client. Okay, so I'm just going to say no here. I don't want to permanently delete this. So I'm going to say no, and what's going to happen is it's going to move it into my image import directory. Now, if I wanted to reattach this to a different client, I'm going to go to this client right here. And I'm going to go back into my images screen. And remember, anytime you select a new client, everything pertains to that client. And I'm going to click on Attach. When I select Attach, okay, here's the recent image that I had. There it is. Okay, I'm going to select that image. I'm going to give it a description. Click on Attach. Or a policy, I click OK, and now there's my new image, and there it is, right there. Okay. All right. So that's how we attach, detach images. Okay. If I need to edit the description of that image, I could certainly do that. Edit it. Okay. When I hit Enter on my keyboard, notice that my Description changed, so I can change that. One other thing that I wanted to point out, and I know that Amy pointed out, is that you need to have a Twain compliant sc scanner. That's what we, we use to scan uh, images. We use your scanner's driver. Once QuickFile locates that driver, okay, then you'll be able to scan. If it is listed here, then you should be able to select it from the list. Okay. Once you've got it selected, then you have the ability to scan. All right. You can scan and scan into selected images. Again, if you have a TIFF document and you want to scan into the selected image, I can do that. And I just click on Scan. It would bring up my scanner's user interface. Okay. Again, I'm going to force it black and white. All right. So when I do that, okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and accept my scan. Okay, and it's just going to go ahead and scan for me. And once it finish, finishes scanning, okay, now you see that my receipt of payment moved because I modified the original date that it was added. Okay, now it says 11-12, and now I have two pages attached. So I have this page here. And I have this page here. Okay. All right. Okay, so that's how we do scanning and attaching. Next, we have our letters screen. And in our letters screen, we wish to see all the letters that were printed out for this client. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go back to our original client here. Click on Letters. And as you can see, here's my invoice. Here's a copy of my payment receipt. Here's my actual payment receipt here. Okay. Here's my copy of my birthday letter any invoices, um, anything else. Anytime you do anything, we automatically store it right here for you to view. If you want to view a larger image of it, you can double click on it. Since it's an invoice, it will tell you that you can't make any modifications, which is fine. You don't necessarily want to, but you maybe just want to look at the invoice number. There it is listed. I can't modify it. I can't change it. Okay, It's just a preview. All right. I do have the ability to reprint it if I wanted to, and that would be just fine. Um, payment payment.rtf if I wanted to um, if I try to delete this letter it's going to pop up a message that says this letter is a receipt and it cannot be deleted okay if you voided out the item in the client billing all right and you wanted to delete the receipt I wouldn't suggest that you do that because that receipt number is there and been used okay all right last but not least or second to last but not least we have our form section and in our form section, we have all of our certificates, 
any form that this client has, has, has attached to their file is listed right here. You'll notice that it's really basically by type of form okay, or by the date that it was added. Okay? That's really how it will appear is by the date that it was added. You can sort these by the form type. You can sort them by the form number. You can sort them by the form added, by the company, or even by the policy. Okay? Once you sort your forms out, then you can see which one's attached to which policy. Now, one of the nice things about our, uh, this form section is we can do a lot of things from here. We can add an accord form. Okay? But Amy showed you a shortcut in the policy screen which said that you could actually add it from directly from the policy screen. The, it, the list just gets, or the information just gets populated over here. Okay? Um, so if you wanted to, you could add an accord form. You can delete a form, but remember, anytime you delete anything, it is permanent. Okay, once it's gone, it's gone. You can't get it back. All right, you'll have to re-enter that information. If you want to display the form, you click on Display Form, and there's the form itself. Click on Return. I can save this as a new form. This is often very handy to do. Sometimes you want to save an, uh, an existing Accord form as a new form for the, for the next policy term. If that's the case, you come into the Forms section of your client, click on Save as New Form. Make sure that first you select the form that you want to save. So for example, if I want to save the um, auto supplement as a new form, okay, and I've done that a couple of times, but if I want to save it as a new form, I simply go up to the very top, I click on Save as New Form, I give it a description, Click OK. There's my new form listed right here. Okay. Now, I may want to change the effective date of that form. So if I wanted to, I could go in and modify my form, change that. Okay. Maybe I want to reattach it to a different policy. Now, I've saved that form for a reason. I want to save it for the renewal. So what I would have to do is I would have to click on Change Policy. Once I click on Change Policy, it's going to ask me, do I wish to change the policy associated with this form? Because once you save it as a new form, it automatically attaches it to the, to the policy in which the, the old form was attached. So what you want to do is you want to change it. So I say yes, and I simply select my form. Okay. I click OK, and I'm going to change it to this one right here. I click OK, and now the form has been attached right here to this policy. Okay? Now, because it was reattached, it changed the date on the form. Because the original form was listed as 612 or 619 or something like that, um, now it is reattached with a new date, 1112. Here it is. Okay? All right. Now, you can edit the description of this. If you don't like the description of your form, you can click on Edit and edit the, the description. We can print email or fax out of here. Amy's done a pretty good job of showing you this. So if I just click on Print Email Fax, I can then select items that I want to print or email out of the system. If I wanted to print this form and I wanted to print this image, I could certainly do that. Okay? If I wanted to email multiple items out of the system, I could do that as well. Okay. What will end up happening is Quick File will then, when you go to send the email, it will convert it into a PDF and send it out. Okay. All right. Um, last but not least, we have in the Forms drawer, or in the Forms section, Add a Group. If I want to add a group, I can add a group to this. Let's say I want to group all my certificates up into one folder. I simply click on Add a Group. I'm going to call it Certificates. So you can see my group is now listed here, at the very bottom. And let's say I want to bring in a couple of certificates in here. Well, in order to do that, I merely select the, the certificate. I drag it down here. When this gets highlighted, the certificates, I unclick or I lift, lift the finger up off the, the uh, mouse and enter it in. Okay? So I click and hold and I add. So it's basically a drag and drop. 
drag it, and drop it in. Now I have three certificates listed here, so that means that they're attached to this particular form. Okay? Because they're attached to this particular form, I can open and close this. All right. Now, that being said, if I want to remove this group, I can click on Remove a Group. All right, but it's not going to let me remove the group. Okay. What it's going to do is it's going to tell me that I can't remove it until I remove these items here. So once I remove these items, then I can remove my group. So I simply just drag it out. Okay. Drag it out and get rid of it. Once it's out, now I can remove my group. Okay. Now, the last thing that we have to discuss, and we're almost done, um, is the activity screen. The activity screen is really where all of the system generated activities will appear. So you'll note that all the entries in this activity screen are system generated. So all those items that are being generated by the system will appear right here, as well as appearing in your memos. Now, remember we told you about your memo type filter so that if you have your memo type filter selected to only display certain items, okay, that's what's going to be listed here, these 14 items. The activities are all going to appear over here. And if I wanted to, I could double click on any one of these to, view, to review what it was that I did. So for example, if I endorsed a policy and I wanted to look at the endorsement, I can double click on it, I can open it up. Okay, so that just shows and displays all of my activities. If I want to see my scanned image, okay, I could do that. There it is. Okay. All right. So that pretty much concludes our, our training session for today. I want to thank you guys for attending. I appreciate your patience. We apologize about the uh, uh, service interruption, but that's all right. I want, to have, want everybody to have a great day. I want you guys to attend tomorrow's training session where we'll wrap up the rest of the quick file program. Everyone have a great day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Amy's going to continue to monitor any questions that you might have, so we'll leave that open for another uh, couple of minutes. Bye, everyone.